and I'm live. It is day two of the Town Hall Summit. If you joined me yesterday, um, you will know how exciting it was. We had a tremendous day, wonderful conversation. Um, there were luminaries from across the globe who joined us, but also that premiere of The Youth Are Watching Part One. Um, I had lots of messages about that yesterday. You get to see part two today. Um, so excited about that, but just what a wonderful day it was. And now we approach day two. Um, just for a moment, I'd like to pause um, because I have a special dedication on day two of the Town Hall Summit one, May 14th, 2020. Just before I was going live on air, I lost my youngest brother. Um, and so I wanna dedicate this to Jason, my brother, um, day two of the Town Hall Summit. Well, actually all of the Town Hall Summit, but particularly today. So Jason, this one is for you. Um, I'd also like to say a couple of thanks before um, the end of the session. People tend to sign off at the end of the day. Um, to my team, I have an amazing team of people who pulled all of this together um, to make sure that, that we brought this to you with a level of quality, um, with a level of vigor around the content, um, and just a level of professionalism that I hope that you are enjoying. Um, so to Alex Swan, who is our logistics manager, thank you. Gunjan Ozdemir, who's in Turkey, um, who was also one of my youth in the, in the documentary. Um, thank you, Gunjan. Um, I want to thank Austin Rowlandson, who's my technical producer, which is why you're seeing this the way that you are. <laughs> I want to thank Andy Blackburn, who is responsible for all of the amazing videos. Um, and, and Angie, oh my goodness, couldn't forget Angie. Angie, who is my um, executive assistant, who has managed all of the calendars of these 16 global leaders um, and mine. So I just want to say thank you to you all and thank you to all the people who supported me through this. And so... We're kicking off day two. The first, let me give you a quick run of the day. Um, we're gonna go to a fireside chat between two amazing women. Um, I can't wait for you to hear this. Um, I'm gonna introduce them in a second, but you know, panel two, no, actually we're gonna panel two, um, will be um, moderated by um, former Wall Street Journal journalist Melanie Trotman, um, who's now the chief editorial consultant and a vice president at Edelman. Um, she'll be moderating our panel called Building and Maintaining Trust During Crisis. Imagine that, um, how appropriate. Um, and then our second plenary panel of the day will be Reimagining Diversity and Inclusion, moderated by yours truly. It's going to be tremendous. And again, as I mentioned, you get to see part two of the documentary. So let's go on to our fireside chat. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Gugu Mfufi, award-winning South African journalist who we are so lucky um, to have. Gugu, welcome. Thank you um, for coming. And then secondly, um, and again, it was a coup to get this woman as well, um, Patricia Obonai, the first Ghanaian female CEO of Vodafone in Ghana. Um, wonderful, wonderful women. You're going to really enjoy this chat. Ladies, over to you. Take it away. Thank you. Patricia, I am excited to have this conversation with you here today, a very critical one as we are both African women who have the opportunity to work with our global counterparts and being globally competitive, yet locally relevant on the continent that we live in. I am tempted to say a uh, happy 2020 because it seems as though there's been a stop and start to the year 2020 as it stands. So not too sure if that might be the right place to start, but I do believe that perhaps this might be a new day, a new beginning, and again, certainly a new month for us to uh, kickstart this, this conversation off with. So I trust that 2020 has been treating you well thus far. Happy 2020, Google, and it's good to see you. I mean, nobody anticipates you yeah, and every day is a new thing for all of us. So I, I guess I can also say happy 2020. We'll talk about 2020 in just a moment and the impact that COVID-19 as well as the lockdown has had on uh, your business and your role. But let's essentially start off on the primary role that you serve at Vodafone. As the CEO of Vodafone Ghana, you recently took over the leadership role from a female executive. You yourself are female. And looking at the executive team that's established at Vodafone Ghana, it's an all-female team. I must tell you, as a woman myself, I looked at this and was pleasantly surprised, but also taken aback and thought that this might be a very interesting nuance for us to discuss regarding leadership on the African continent at an executive level in 2020. How, what has this experience been like for you? And uh, I, I'm assuming for you, it's quite the norm. You know, it's been phenomenal. I, as a, when I was in technology, and I used to be a technology director and I had an all male team. And it was quite uncomfortable until I had a woman join the team. 
So when I took up the CEO role, um, for me, having women on the leadership team was a very deliberate action that had to be taken. There were women on the team, but I felt that I had to build it even more. And now that with the diversity that I have at the table, that boardroom, I think, is the most, <laughs> the most interesting anybody would want to experience. I have seven member team, five of them are women, um, and the nationalities are different. They have different backgrounds. So I have diversity of background. I have diversity of race. I have diversity of mindset. And when they bring their strengths to the table, you can be sure that it is representational. We are speaking the mind of the consumer. We have everybody at the table and, and it's, it's amazing. By the time I'm leaving the boardroom, I know the decision we have made is fair, it's balanced, and I have inputs from, from everyone. I'm intrigued to understand how that might add to the quality of leadership for an organization as large as Vodafone. What key outcomes have you seen there in terms of the quality of leadership that comes out from your team members? You know, it makes such a difference when, when you have women at the table because women also make decisions based on guts, based on their, based on their intuition. Um, women have strengths that are quite unique. Um, the fact that they are caregivers in their homes, the fact that women raise their children, the fact that um, women have seen their mothers struggle through. A lot of our mothers didn't have the opportunity we had. So there's this inherent strength that an African woman in particular brings um, when she gets to that C-suite level. There's a lot of strength that she can tap into. Um, and then there's a lot of passion as well. Um, and I, I still talk about that. There's no always data that's available, but you can trust that based on the past experiences that she's had as a woman, which is unique to her as a woman, she will be able to, to bring to bear that discussion to the table and help you to make the right decision. I mean, women are 50% of our population. I can't imagine that we'll be sitting here making decisions about the women who we serve, um, the women who we want to make impact on and not have their input at the table. And for me, that's the difference that I see in my boardroom. Anytime we have to make a decision, we get the view of the woman. I'm glad that you highlight the important role of women there. And the fundamental purpose of this conversation is really to raise uh, awareness and, of course, seek ideals in terms of leadership, given that this is part of a buildup of conversations that we've had with the town hall. And I'm keen to understand how this leadership, this female leadership within Vodafone Ghana, might have been disrupted by COVID-19. I started off the conversation saying happy 2020, but we all know that the last nine months of the year have been uh, very short of being very happy. Happy. they've been met with their own sense of challenges. What has that meant or how has that tested your leadership skills and abilities, including that of your team? You know, I always say that um, as a woman having led a technology team, I've seen it all. I've seen the equipment who don't want to talk to you and then they just shut down, you know. But COVID is this new test. COVID brought its own new level of test to my, my leadership. I used to meet the entire organization once a quarter, update them on the performance of the company. I'm very fun loving, so would have fun activities in the quarter. I never thought that I would be engaging the organization once a week. I mean, since March, every week we have a live session where I directly speak to the, the entire organization. You know, with COVID, people are looking for comfort, they're looking for leadership, they're looking for direction. They want a sense that your business is not dying and there's a future for them post-COVID and because of um, a lot of companies having to shut down, having to lay people off. And you having to stay composed, you know, you have your own challenges at home, your kids um, at home doing online schooling. Um, you have your regular challenges of having to create a new workplace for yourself at home, but then supporting your employees um, every week, having a story for them, checking how they're doing, working on their questions, basic things as their connectivity at home, checking on their families. It makes such a difference. You know, leadership is about relationship. It's about influence. If you're able to build relationship with the people you lead, you are able to influence. And I've seen that come across so strongly. Every, um, every other week, and now we've moved it to once a month, we actually take a survey, a poll survey of our staff to find out how they are doing. And I can tell you since March, we've stayed above 70, 78. Just the last one was about 83% of how connected my people are. 
this doesn't come from discussing PNL. This comes from touching their hearts, making them feel that you are empathetic. You care about what's happening to them. You're interested in how they're faring at home, how they transition back to the office. Um, listen, I could write a book on this experience. Books are always welcome, uh, Patricia, and I'm hoping that you certainly will pen one down uh, one day. Uh, and I'm keen to actually translate this into the, the themes of leadership that we see across the continent uh, and perhaps how we need to, to elevate them more. Um, I'm based here in Johannesburg, South Africa. You're based in Ghana. And if you just think back to the 2010 World Cup, I think you'll know what a close relationship uh, the, the Black Stars and uh, South Africa actually do have. Oh, yeah. uh, given, uh, exactly, the favoritism in soccer. And the theme about leadership that you bring up really um, um, how it is that we can continue to cultivate a, a relationship and a role of leadership that is empathetic, as you describe, um, that transcends borders, particularly because COVID has led us to lock down our borders, lock down our cities. And it almost seems as though whilst we are still able to be virtually connected, at times, the interpersonal connections and relationships are, 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 are still being threatened by the lack of connectivity as well as increased social distancing. So in a nutshell, my question to you is, the lessons that you've learned at Vodafone Ghana, how do you hope that these can transcend other entities, political spheres, other regions, particularly across the African continent, to elevate um, our leadership and the productivity of our people as a whole? I tell you something. So as I'm speaking to you, I have one of my executive members in Egypt. My finance director is seated in Egypt. My technology director is seated in London. My marketing director is seated in India. Um, and my commercial operations manager is seated in, in London as well. She left last week. How are we supposed to work together? How are we supposed to drive engagement? How are we supposed to business going? I think the important thing, apart from creating the platform to discuss the performance, which is typical. It's about the connection. This is what a lot of leaders need to learn, even in times like this and, and beyond. I call my team, I find out how their wives are doing, I find out how their daughters are doing, I find out how their husbands are doing, boyfriends are doing. It's, it, it looks very basic. I show up um, at programs for my staff when they have like weddings or funerals when it is convenient. When you speak to somebody and you ask him about, how's your son? How's your daughter? Even if you don't remember the person's name, he begins to feel a connection. People work for the company. They work for the company because they believe the company cares. And as the leader, I think it is not always about driving performance. They know that's why you are there. When you open your mouth, they're expecting you to ask them about the last sales that they did. But when you start the conversation with Sami, how are you? And how's your wife? You talked about the last time she had this accident. I hope everything is fine. By the way, I was looking for this information. When you build that relationship and you build that connection, people begin to feel like they, they are part of the organization. The results belong to them. And I think this is what our political leaders, this is what our, um, our leaders in the private sector, policy makers, should not see themselves elevated above who they are. We're human first. We are human first. And I think when you bring the heart to the way you work, and that's why for me, um, I always say leading with purpose. You must lead beyond just the profit because these people know that is why you are there. But when you start showing leadership that goes beyond just the, the core of your business, it actually begins to become part of your core. The, 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 the purpose for which you are existing as a human being begins to come out. And then you, it gets your employees to also give they give, I give you an example and um, Google. When we um, we started, the, when the lockdown happened and things were difficult, nobody could anticipate what happened to companies. We said we weren't going to lay anybody off, but it didn't mean that I could afford all the allowances, the excesses that I had budgeted to give to my employees in this new financial year. So I had a conversation with them and said, guys, I'd hold back some of it, I'll pay you in October. Would you believe that when we launched um, um, a fundraising event online to get my staff to donate to women who were suffering abuse during COVID, it was overwhelming. The staff actually participated, they brought DJs online just to be able to raise funds. Why do you think they've gotten to that point? They stopped thinking about what the company does for me. They felt, how do I carry the brand? 
Today, when I launch a campaign, a marketing campaign, you'll find it more on the DPs, on the status of my employees, on their Facebook pages. Um, they drive word of mouth, and it's because we've done well to try and with my leadership team to build empathy, to build a connection, a relationship with the employees that goes just beyond their job roles. And I think this is very, very important. Patricia, I am uh, intrigued by how you mentioned that human force first. We are human first is an element that you emphasize. And I want to throw that back into your corner. I know that you are a loving wife. You are a mother of three wonderful boys. Uh, and that makes me want to ask the question, how do you, not only how have you coped with your family during this particular time, but also if you are a leader who has been called to lead this large corporate institution, how do you maintain the leadership role and, and, and still being empathetic and still being emotionally available for your loved ones at home, especially during such a turbulent time where it feels as though you're continuously pouring from your cup? You know, um, it's just grace. It's just grace because it comes with its own challenges. But I think my family, I've had such a, um, a packed job role since I started. I started um, a leadership role at, at a tender age. Um, so it's it's carried along into my marriage and and then with my children coming they already met a busy mom um but i think what has been important to them is again the connection so when i'm present at home i'm very present my last boy is seven years old and i sit by him to have his online class and then right after that i'm on a call with with the phone discussing um sales and distribution um i do i do well especially over the weekends to binge on movies with them um, we go out to do popcorn and coal um, I spend quality time with my kids and it's not about the big the big things, it's about the little things that matters to them. Um, traveling and buying clothes for my kids is not relevant. Sitting with them, watching a movie and having a drink is their quality time. Playing basketball with them and then pretending that they're beating me to the game is all that matters to them. It's about the connection. Um, and so when I'm not available, um, they know mommy is not available, but when she's present, I do well to make sure I'm absolutely present. Um, I do well to attend the uh, parents' teacher associations in school. Um, I know what's happening with their curriculum in school. It's it's deliberate. I make them know that I am interested, you know, and it makes a difference. My husband is a mechanical engineer. His schedule is probably worse than mine. Um, and so he's, he's also very deliberate about when he's present at home, then he's helping them with homework. He's playing basketball. He's fixing their bicycle. Things that you could bring a third party to do, you deliberately do it. Um, I pack their breakfast in the morning when they are going to school. You're very, very deliberate about those actions so that they know that mommy cares. It's just that she has a busy schedule. And they're able to work that um, in between. And so far, it's worked. I try not to bring my home to work, uh, but sometimes I take work home, <laughs> which is so unfair. Um, but... I guess they're used to it. It's part of life. If they want to enjoy the benefits, then they have to make the sacrifices as well, I guess. Yeah. It's also able to give so much of yourself in all these different spheres of your life. And um, as you Vigi has been a key enabler, not only in connecting us to have this conversation here today and many of our peers will also be participating in the town hall but even with your colleagues and that brings to light the role and importance that technology can play in terms of innovation across the continent and specifically addressing African challenges and problems. I recall a conversation you hosted at a TEDx event in 2014 where you called for more girl geeks to come on board. And I guess in a post-COVID world, this is uh, even more uh, of a requirement to make sure that we have ongoing productivity as well as participation and collaboration. How do you see this role evolving? Uh, not only to have girls coming on board in terms of working in technology, but also ensuring that the youth overall across the continent in Africa are able to be innovators. You know, Google, I think we're missing such a big opportunity. I keep saying if women are 50% of the population, then we are missing a percentage of that contribution to the growth of the economy. We are only getting the benefit of those who we have allowed to participate. It's strange that we still see women as economic burdens, and a lot of countries are marrying away these young girls and um, just to make money for their family. What you have done is to cut away somebody's ability to make income, somebody's ability to contribute to the economy, to grow, to, to grow and bring out the potential for herself. 
If you look at STEM-based jobs today in the world, I mean, technology is being embedded in everything we want. And whether we like it or not, not the industrial revolution has started. People are embedding technology in the way they connect things. People are already connected. Communities are getting connected. So it's about global competitiveness. We have to allow our youth to participate. The median age of Ghana is 20. Can you imagine? We have more young people in the country than adults. We don't have the problem of worrying about an aging population and looking at health costs. We have a budding youth who can change this economy. It's not about gold, it's not about cocoa, it's not about oil, it's about human capital. The opportunity for job roles is twice as high in STEM-based jobs than in non-STEM-based jobs. The guy who is learning STEM-based jobs can take a reverse in his career and go into non-STEM-based job, but usually the other way is more difficult. When you train somebody to have a background in STEM, I'm not asking him to become a developer. I'm asking him to learn how to apply the knowledge of science. It helps you to problem think. It helps you to be a critical thinker to problem solve, to apply knowledge. And, and I think that from where the world is going, the new problems that COVID has introduced with the fourth industrial revolution, which is already hitting us, we have no option, it's no longer a choice to make sure that the environment we are creating for our youth, the employment opportunities we are creating, the training, the education we are giving to them has an inherent basic STEM embedded in it. Listen, it's going to change the world. It is no longer an option in knowing how to use technology, in applying it. Jobs are being eroded because of technology, but opportunities are being created as well. So it's, it's huge. I, I just can't understand why we were taking it in, in baby steps when the world is accelerating. Africa has such a huge potential. I'm not talking about the ability to innovate. There are so many innovators in Africa and we don't talk about it. The challenge they have is scale, is the ability to support, to be supported. And that's where the policyholders have to come in and, and support them. So I am very passionate about it. And you can see I'm talking a lot about this, but I believe that we are missing um, an opportunity to support the youth, expose them to what is out there, expose them to the future opportunity, cut down youth unemployment by just getting them to believe that STEM creates the opportunity for the world. They will be globally competitive when they start getting their minds to it and become problem solvers. I'm glad you mentioned the passion that you're displaying here because I can see it. It's palpable itself. And as you say, we're looking to be globally competitive with the innovation that we have in the continent. What message then do you have to the audience of global participants who are watching this, who are observing this, uh, and who might in some way or other be able to support African innovators to scale and uplift their businesses, um, um, going beyond just financial contributions, but really in terms of mentorship um, um, or, or, or skills or, or additional sponsorship? Uh, are we losing out an opportunity there as well for the rest of the world to understand just how innovative the African continent is? There are quite a number of opportunities for all those listening to me and want to participate. One is influencing the educational content that we have. I mean, we should stop, we should move away from just teaching our kids how to pass tests, how to be compliant, how to acquire knowledge. We must teach them how what to do with the knowledge that has been acquired. I think that's the first opportunity. The next is creating the platform for them to see where the job roles are. So we all talk about it's good to have the youth, but we must be deliberate in employment. For those listening to me, if you have opportunities to get the youth into your organization, just like we have done in Vodafone, be deliberate about it and bring them in. They may come with no knowledge. They may come with skills that you can develop. Okay, they have strengths that you can build on. And they are such a, I met a group of, 20 or 16 youth um, just last week in my boardroom. And it was so refreshing just listening to them and what value they will bring to my organization. They are new to telecom, but we're happy to have them on board because they will change the organization. The third one, so apart from creating the opportunity for them, the third one is partnering with them. There are a number of startups, there are a number of young people who are struggling. They need the guidance. It's not about money. It's about how to build skill, how to build the knowledge, how to grow their business. They need the technical training. They need the understanding. And you can help them um, by, by mentoring, by guiding, by, by partnering with them. Um, and I think the last one is definitely um, driving connectivity into areas where our youth are, but they don't have access. If we're able to put mobile phones in the hands of our youth, our women, our young girls, 
then it would move them away from unintended pregnancies. They will be focused on driving um, something very productive for their lives. And, and you can see the change happening. So the opportunity is vast. It's just about the willingness um, for all of us listening, all of us who are alive, to want to participate to see a better future for, for our young people. Patricia, I want to throw this back into your court by drawing up on your own personal experience. You have recently motivated um, a few university students at your alma mater, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. And we know that that's been a great birthplace for a lot of innovators and uh, technology leaders who then seek and pursue opportunities elsewhere in the world. Uh, and that's often been the challenge of the African continent uh, in terms of having a very rich diaspora, uh, but a community which is serving other communities and other uh, uh, countries uh, and perhaps uh, in their own way uh, lacking in contribution that needs to come back to their homes. A double-edged question that I have to throw in your corner. As a youth, you could have had the opportunity to stay working in uh, more developed markets, but you chose to come back home. My key question for you there is why Ghana, even when the world is your oyster? And if we could throw that back to members of the diaspora to say to them, even if they are in other communities, how they still need to prioritize their home countries for development. You know, I, um, I was born, schooled, bred in Ghana. I had the opportunity to school and, and a number of opportunities to go outside um, for, for further education. But I've always not been, um, I haven't struggled with finding the opportunity to work in Ghana. Actually, um, from school, I was an, an intern. And the day I finished my internship, I got my offer letter and I've worked for the past 22 years. I haven't had the haven't even thought of, of 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 leaving. I have seen such an opportunity in Ghana to contribute my 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 best and also to help others. I mean, there are so many people around. Every time I have the opportunity, the platforms that you mentioned, I always advocate for our youth to to contribute their best to to believe in themselves. There's so much they can give, and I keep saying, if Ghana is going to change, it's going to be about the people. It won't be about our cocoa, our diamond, and our gold. It's going to be about how much we invest in people. So for those out there, just last week, one very young guy, I remember so well growing up in the community in which I grew up, reaching out to me and saying, um, I, I've now completed my university. I am good in network. I'm good in artificial intelligence, automation. And how can I help? I almost fell off my seat. I was like, I am so looking for you, you know, <laughs> and you, you, you need to you need to partner with us. Today, I have an employee sitting in Nigeria and contributing his work to Vodafone Ghana. Because of COVID, he can't join us, but we have been able to employ him. So there's, there's, there's opportunity to work directly with companies today. There's opportunity to also work with um, our startups. Like I said, they need partnership, they need guidance, and there's a platform where you can find them. Um, where we have a lot of startups today and you can find them and be direct and deliberate about supporting them. Um, there's so much opportunity in Ghana. Last year we had the year of return. A lot of our, our colleagues, our friends in the diaspora visited. Many of them established contacts with businesses. Um, we have a lot of policies the government has launched that is trying to, to build um, the private sector, enable the private sector. There are a lot of incentives. And so there's no reason why you shouldn't partner in this. There's no reason why you shouldn't be seen um, actively involved in, in supporting. If there's any way that I can be of help, please reach out. I'm available on all the social media handles um, and I can, can connect you to the right sources, but there's enough information out there um, for those who want to help. It's huge. We haven't even scratched the surface of how we're embedding technology in our health, in our education, in our mining, um, in our teaching, in the work of the artisans, um, listen, is endless. Why not come on board? Very right. Why not come on board? Patricia, I want us to tie this back to the conversation of leadership and still focusing on youth. As you've mentioned, the continent and the country is made up of at least 50% women. We are rich within a youthful population. Uh, but when you take a look at the disgruntlement that is often displayed by the youth, particularly on social media platforms, be it the political environment in South Africa, be it what's happening in Mozambique, the UK, or even the United States, there's a strong sense of sharing their frustration and disgruntlement on social media and not believing in their own personal leadership skills to 
take up the banner, uh, pick up the mast, and of course, continue running the race and actually displaying their own leadership capabilities by shifting and changing the narrative in the direction they wanted to go in. Given that you speak to the youth so often, I want you to speak to the youth globally, not just African youth, but youth that might be African and connected across uh, many other countries in the world as to what your hopes and goals are for leadership for them and most importantly, how best they can tap into that power and catapult it for significant change. Thank you. You know, I give you another story because I believe the stories help. I was approached recently by, you know, in Ghana, the alumni, your old school, being part of your old school is such a big deal. And I was approached by one of my old, uh, my high school um, leaders and said, we want you to take up one of the leadership roles that's going to be available. I was like, you know I am busy. However, this presents an opportunity again for me to contribute. If you don't actively participate, your voice will not be heard. You can scream on social media, that is fine. Your opinion is being, is being um, you're venting, but you must be actively involved. I think the president of Ghana said that once um, to, to the woman. You have to participate for your voice to be heard. So I am expecting that when when the next time parliamentary roles are being opened up, I find a lot of our youth up there shaping policy, be in parliament and influence the policies that affect the youth. If you want to contest for an assemblyman at the, 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 the district assemblies, by all means be there. Be in your school alumni roles, take leadership roles, be actively participating. You can write, you can scream. You can demonstrate it is your right it is fine but in the end when the policy makers are sitting at the table you are not there your your future is, is is being determined by people who have moved on generations ahead of you we need you at the table and so active participation by the youth in policy making if you want to influence it then be the lecturers at the universities be the startups, be the leaders on the startups. Do not only have the sense of entitlement that somebody owes you something, it is fine, yes, you pay your taxes, but I think it is important that you begin to actively, actively take up roles, participate in shaping the future. This is very important. Patricia, I've thoroughly enjoyed our engagement here today, and I believe that you've left us with many nuggets to bear in mind in terms of what leadership is, uh, whether it's pre-COVID or post-COVID, but ultimately it begins with us being human first, being empathetic, and also understanding that uh, by prioritizing human capital over natural resources, that's truly where we can unlock the true potential, not only of our individuals and our people on the continent, but also of uh, the continent's economy and globally. It reminds me of the words of uh, the Ghanaian president, Akofu Ado, who said at the beginning of uh, the plight of COVID-19 as a pandemic, that we don't know how to bring people back to life, but we do know how to bring economies back to life. And it seems as though that, again, all stems back to true leadership. Thank you so much for your time today, Patricia. We've thoroughly enjoyed uh, engaging with you. It's been a pleasure. And I just want to say to you, Google, that you're doing an amazing job. I've followed your story and I think you're an example to many of our youth as well. So well done to you. Thanks for the time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patricia. Much appreciated.